Thank you and my uh, sincere apologies for this. After having left Delhi 15 years back, I always forget how long it takes to <laughs> commute on Delhi's roads. I had a presentation in Delhi School of Economics and I thought it would take 45 minutes and it took uh, substantially more. Um, so I'm sorry about that. Um, well, this is, uh, I mean, the topic that's been given to us is obviously very, very large. Uh, it covers, uh, can actually virtually cover everything under the sun. Um, what I thought I'd do today uh, with uh, the permission of the organizers is to focus on uh, one theme that I've been working on in the last uh, few years and on which a couple of us have just uh, done a book. My co-author is also here, Asim Srivastav. Uh, on globalization and how it has, in the last 20 years in particular, affected India's environment, people, society, culture. And uh, do we have alternatives? Do we have ways that not just confront the current uh, crises that uh, development, globalized development has caused, but also uh, provide answers to uh, human well-being? Um, and of course, I will try and uh, focus this on issues of biodiversity since that's the main subject. Um, how much time do I have? So about 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. All right, so uh, I'm not going to go too much into detail in the base, on the basics, uh, the, the fundamentals of, of this globalized development, but essentially, if you look at it, both the, the model of development that we've followed in the last few decades and in particular in the last couple of decades since 1991 when the current prime minister who was then finance minister brought in the economic reforms, so-called reforms, um, you, we find that uh, there are some essential aspects that actually underlie the kind of damage that they're causing. One, that economic growth is the ultimate um, objective that everything can be justified in the name of economic growth, that we have to have 7, 8, 9, and if possible, 10% double-digit economic growth. And if we do that, as a country, we will be able to move out of poverty and we will be able to get into uh, being wealthier and prosperous and, and so on. Um, we have heard several times our uh, political leaders and many of our economists saying that economic growth has to happen at any cost. And they're actually quite right. It does happen at any cost. But that at any cost is often hidden, or at least it's hidden from those in our uh, corridors of power who are taking the decision. We can talk about social costs, but I won't do that here. Let's just talk about ecological costs. The statistics are all out there, so I won't bore you with them. But there's been some very interesting trends in the last uh, couple of decades of what has happened to uh, to the environment. If you take, for instance, fisheries, marine fisheries in particular, uh, we analyze the uh, both the, the domestic consumption and the export figures of what is taken out of our seas. And uh, in the last 20 years, there's been a sort of quantum leap in the amount that is actually fished out of our, especially our territorial waters. Uh, the kinds of commercial operations that have actually moved into the uh, territorial waters, in many cases displacing the traditional fishing communities, and in most cases or all cases not actually being mindful of the ecological limits of the seas. And the sea is a vast open space, we think it's unlimited, and therefore anything that can be taken out of it can be taken without any damage, which is of course not the case. So actually for the first time in history, we're beginning to see uh, declines in stock in a number of the fisheries, especially in the territorial waters, if not so much in the deep seas. Um, if we take uh, mining as another example, the uh, uh, since 1991 onwards, mining production has again jumped several fold. But what is most interesting is that the government has actually made it easier and easier for mining companies and corporations, and mind you, after 1991, a large number of the global corporations, which are very big mining companies, have also come in. But of course, there are also Indian ones. Uh, that has the, the, the ease with which now you can actually get permits for mining or for reconnaissance and exploration of mining 
uh, has become such that today 15% of India, okay, 15% of India's land mass is under my mining reconnaissance. A company can today get 50,000 square kilometers of area for mining exploration. The 2008 or 9 uh, mining policy actually even suggests that if a mining company is given exploration uh, and reconnaissance license, they should be automatically considered for actually doing the mining also in the same area if they find that there are minerals of uh, you know that can be taken out with viability um, you take forests uh, information received from the ministry of environment itself first uh, in fact by our organization and then a very good analysis done by cse uh, shows very clearly that there has been a, a significant increase in the rate at which forest lands are being diverted for things like mining or other so-called development projects. Now, all of this is happening at the same time that the government is saying we need to harmonize environment and development, we must protect the environment for future generations, etc., etc., etc. We had a report, uh, this is what we're actually consuming from nature, and then if you talk about what we're throwing back into nature, that also is very interesting. Um, plastics, for instance, as we all know, uh, plastics production and use and consumption in India has exploded in the last few years. It's exploded well beyond the increase in population. It's not as if simply because we have that many more people, therefore there's that much more plastic. Per capita, plastic consumption has actually significantly gone up much of which is being thrown out as waste so that we're producing five and a half thousand uh, tons of plastic waste every day in India. We know where it's going. I was recently in Bhuj, uh, in Kutch, and uh, hundreds of trees there are adorned not with flowers anymore, but with plastic bags. It's a very windy place, so plastic gets uh, blown out of the garbage dumps and then goes and sticks itself on trees. It's an amazing sight. Um, so, or you take electronic waste, the kind of consumption we do of electronics, all of us do, and the kind of redundancy that's built into our electronic system so that mobile phones go out of uh, fashion every two years or three years and new ones have to be bought. Uh, we are producing uh, 800,000 tons of uh, electronic waste every day, every year. I mean, these are figures, but the overall sense I'm trying to give is that the kind of environmental impact and therefore then the impact on biological diversity after all if forests are being diverted you can do a plantation somewhere else and replace that forest but it will never actually replace the forest a natural forest simply cannot be replaced so uh, the kind of biodiversity loss we're talking about is obviously immense unfortunately we have no statistical uh, we have no robust figures for what kind of biodiversity loss we're having but a process that we did a few years back asking a whole lot of scientists about what is the loss, rate of loss yielded anything between 10% of India's biological diversity being uh, threatened with extinction to 65 to 70% being threatened with extinction depending on which rates one took, what kind of projections you did, etc, 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 etc. All of which is pretty uh, alarming. We had a, res a report a few years back, I think 2008 or 2009, by the, interestingly enough, by the Chambers, uh, the, the Confederation of Indian Industries, CII, and uh, something called the Global Footprint Network, which looked at India's ecological footprint over the last couple of decades. Um, and they said that uh, India now, after China and the US, is has the third largest ecological footprint in the world. But more interestingly and alarmingly, that we are already using twice the biological capacity that can be sustained by India's natural resources and that over the last two or three decades we've actually halved that biological capacity already. Uh, the methods that they use are a little unclear uh, but uh, and maybe so therefore the figures and the analysis might be a little different if you use different methods but I think the overall message is very clear that our path of development is clearly leading us to unsustainability. Ecologically, at least speaking, it is it is unsustainable. And what the impacts are on us as human beings 
is very clear in terms of the losses of li the loss of livelihoods of people who directly depend on natural ecosystems fishing communities farming communities adivasis uh, etc etc but also ultimately on on all of us um we've had uh, the the latest figure that is available of people being displaced by this de development project this kind of development projects is 60 million that's more than the population of most countries in the world 60 million people physically displaced from their houses and lands for develop so called development and this does not count the numbers of people whose livelihoods have been displaced or destroyed because of ecological destruction there's no figure available for that there's no government agency that is even bothering to figure out what is the kind of loss of livelihoods that is entailed in ecological destruction what also is in very interesting in the last uh, couple of decades especially is the way in which very hard fought environmental gains of the 1980s 70s and 80s if you see a lot of the legislation that we use today environmental legislation it is uh, born out of environmental movements thinking debate dialogue and sensitive government officers themselves in the 1970s and 80s pollution legislation the wildlife legislation the forest legislation etc etc um significant amounts of those are actually in the last two decades uh being diluted either diluted in the law itself as has happened for instance with the environment protection act and notifications under that or diluted in practice as has happened for instance with the forest conservation act which has become essentially a forest clearance act because virtually every project that is going to the ministry is being cleared there are very few that are actually stopped um where and it's very interesting i don't know if you were there but in 1992 uh, dr manmohan singh when he was then finance minister and had brought in all these economic reforms he actually gave an spwd public lecture right, maybe yeah. it's part of the same series yeah. yeah and it was in india international center if i'm not mistaken in the in the big hall and he said back then that uh, environment is very important for india india's people environment and development concerns have to be harmonized however in order to invest in environmental protection we need to raise the resources the money which we don't have right now and it is through this new these economic reforms and new economic policies that we'll be able to raise the money to put into the environment now there are two flaws there the first is a is a fatal flaw which is that it assumes that once you destroy the environment you can actually replace it and as we already said with something like forests once it's gone there's no way in which you can replace a forest that has evolved over 500000 years or 3 million years yeah and the second flaw is look at the budgets of the ministry of environment we analyzed it for the book and these 20 years of budgets the ministry of environment which which has the prime uh, 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 let's say ma mandate and responsibility for protecting envi india's environment the budget has never gone beyond 1% it's always been less than 1% of the total budget and 2010 11 if i'm not mistaken it was the lowest ever in india's history 0.56 0.46% of the total budget so there is a lot more money being generated in the economy but it's not necessarily going in to environmental conservation at least if one takes that the ministry as an indicator you can take other indicators like what's happening with uh, say renewable energy etc and there's actually not that much investments that are going into uh, uh, arenas that would help in protecting the environment definitely not biodiversity so this is the overall uh, analysis that that we have uh, of globalized development every time that we as environmentalists uh, uh, you know we we believe we we uh, are sad about the fact that the ministry of environment or the government is taking particular decisions and we say oh but it should be looking at the environment etc i think we need to be mindful of the fact that within this framework of economy there is no way in which biodiversity is going to be protected you can tinker around a little bit you can create a few protected areas here and there but even those are going to eventually vanish if we have this kind of predatory model of economic development and we're opening up our entire natural resource sectors to the corporate sector whether it's indian or foreign there are alternatives there are other ways of doing this oh one other thing which i forgot to mention is that uh, along with greater budgets 
if we are for instance moving into this kind of very rapid phase of industrialization and urbanization and so on we need to also increase the institutional capacity of the government uh, to deal with the environmental consequences of this as an example every project or most projects uh, that are cleared through the environment ministry are cleared through an environmental impact assessment and clearance procedures so one would think that okay if the ministry is clearing uh, something like 100 projects a month okay again analysis that has come from the ministry itself using rti uh, that they would have significantly increased their own staffing so that they could be looking at these projects from a you know very closely from an environmental impact assessment procedure and then once if and when the project is cleared to see if the conditions under which the project are cleared is act are actually being met or not and you find that there's something like 15 to 20 officers across the whole country that are monitoring 6000 projects this is data from about 3 or 4 years back there is no way even the most committed officers would be able to do that in any meaningful manner most projects are actually not monitored an analysis we did about 15 years back of dams 300 dams that had been cleared by the ministry of environment we found that 90% of them were in violation of the conditions the environmental conditions under which they were cleared so neither the budgets nor the institutional capacity actually being enhanced to deal with this this space and this level and the scale of so called development that is taking place it is it is completely con, con, uh, unsustainable what do we do as alternatives how am i doing on time you're out of time but go ahead five finish? minutes yeah, five minutes ahead. okay thanks um what we find uh, across the country are a very large number of communities institutions organizations civil society groups and government agencies that are actually doing things very differently if the ultimate aim is human well being which is to say water food shelter um, and so on and so forth health education etc we are finding actually literally thousands of initiatives across the country where they've been able to do that without causing the kind of ecological damage and inequalities and displacement that this current model does there are many examples that we've given uh, i'd be very happy to share them many groups including cac culprits etc have worked on these sorts of models that are actually out there available they're there they're, they're happening the grassroots initiatives some are small some are very large they're beginning to link up they're beginning to actually say what are the kinds of policy changes that are needed in order to actually make them happen but whether it is decentralized uh, water harvesting or uh, sustainable agriculture or urban renewal uh, projects uh, or uh, decentralized uh, renewable energy projects uh, governance uh, which is uh, you know at a small and or regional eco regional scale go local governance etc etc i mean whole lot of things local trading institutions uh, community based farmer unions and associations and companies that are actually beginning to uh, have their own share and say in the market eliminating the middlemen so that all the benefits and revenues go back straight to the producers as farmers or crafts persons or whatever they are actually exploding across the country but there's still not a critical mass to provide the kind of answer that is needed against this kind of globalized development that critical mass will only happen once they actually not just increase in numbers and size but also when people like us actually push the policy changes that are needed to support them and push governments into understanding the kind of unsustainability that they are actually uh, taking the country into so uh, let me stop there i mean there are i, I probably during the discussion i can i can add we'll to come this back to it, absolutely yeah. thank you thank you thank you ashish um, ravi